Hey everyone, this lesson is on the antibiotics known as aminoglycosides. The aminoglycoside antibiotics all end in mycin, mycin with an I, or simply sin. And if you see thromycin, that is actually a macrolide and not an aminoglycoside. So for aminoglycoside antibiotics, they only end in mycin with a Y, mycin with an I, or sin. So some of the examples of aminoglycosides are streptomycin, gentamicin, tobramycin, or amikacin. Streptomycin was actually the first aminoglycoside, and it was actually discovered in streptomyces bacteria. The other aminoglycosides were all developed later on. This includes gentamicin, tobramycin, and amikacin. The aminoglycosides are almost always used with another antibiotic. So they're generally used to broaden the spectrum of coverage or act as a adjunct for therapy. And they're only administered parenterally. So that means that they're only administered via IV. So what are some of the bacterial targets for aminoglycosides? The bacterial targets for aminoglycosides are the gram-negative aerobic bacilli. So gram-negative aerobic bacilli include E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, and Pseudomonas. With regards to Pseudomonas, the aminoglycoside Tobermycin has greater activity against Pseudomonas than Gentamicin does. The aminoglycosides are also um, active against mycobacteria, like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and in fact, streptomycin was an early or one of the first treatments for tuberculosis. And it's very important that the aminoglycosides are only used for gram-negative aerobic bacilli. They're not used for gram-positive aerobes. They don't have activity for gram-positive aerobes. And they're not useful against anaerobes. So it's very specific coverage. Aminoglycosides are only used for gram-negative aerobic bacilli. So the Treatments for aminoglycosides include what we consider serious infections. So if we're using them parenterally, if we're using them IV, we assume that the patient is probably admitted to hospital. So it's going to be for serious infections. Some of these include infective endocarditis. So infective endocarditis is actually um, generally treated with gentamicin as a uh, one of the antibiotics in the uh, backbone treatment of, of infective endocarditis. It's also used for other complicated infections like complicated UTIs, complicated skin and soft tissue infections. Aminoglycosides are also used for septicemia, osteomyelitis, and pneumonia. So for these infections that I just mentioned, the aminoglycoside antibiotic is used in combination with another antibiotic from a different class. But for the last two, where I title monotherapy, Tularemia and the plague, so Yersinia pestis infections, can actually be treated by just an aminoglycoside. So we generally use either streptomycin or gentamicin for treatment of tularemia or the plague, and we don't need to use any other uh, antibiotics with it. The aminoglycosides are rapidly bactericidal. And they do this by binding to and inhibiting bacterial 30S ribosomal subunit. They also have what is known as a post-antibiotic effect. That post-antibiotic effect means that there is a persistent suppression of bacterial growth even after removal of the antibiotic. So if a patient's been treated with aminoglycoside for a certain number of days, we remove the antibiotic, there's still what we call this post-antibiotic effect where there's a persistent suppression of bacterial growth, uh, growth even after removing it. So the mechanism of action is again an aminoglycoside binds to a bacterial 30S ribosomal subunit inhibiting that 30S ribosomal subunit leading to decreased protein synthesis and eventually in the case of the aminoglycosides leads to rapid bacterial cidal effect. So the aminoglycosides have specific adverse reactions that are important to recognize and to remember. One of those is autotoxicity. So what happens is 
aminoglycoside use can lead to vestibular and cochlear damage. It can also eventually lead to symptoms of vertigo and disequilibrium, tinnitus, so ringing of the ears, and even hearing loss. So because of these reasons, we try to avoid aminoglycoside use whenever possible. However, there has been some evidence that using N-acetylcysteine along with the aminoglycoside can actually reduce some of this autotoxicity. The other important adverse reaction of aminoglycosides that I want you guys to remember is nephrotoxicity. This is in the form of like an acute tubular necrosis. It generally occurs in about 10 to 20 percent of patients that actually receive aminoglycosides. But what's good about this is that most of these cases are reversible. So the big issue with aminoglycoside use is the autotoxicity, but also the nephrotoxicity leading to acute kidney injuries via an acute tubular necrosis. The other adverse reactions to aminoglycosides include neuromuscular blockade. So with regards to neuromuscular blockade effect from aminoglycosides, any patient that has a neuromuscular um, disorder, spe uh, specifically myasthenia gravis, uh, should not use aminoglycosides. So myasthenia gravis is an absolute contraindication to aminoglycoside use. Anyways, guys, I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on aminoglycosides. If you did find this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Also, check out my other antibiotic lessons in my infectious disease playlist. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.